you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us. Maybe we can start by, you know, you introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Sheil Manat. I'm based in San Francisco and I run a fund called Better Tomorrow Avengers. We are a $75 million fund focused on investing in seed stage fintech companies globally. Myself and my partner, Jake, are both former founders ourselves. I started a payments company and an auction company that were both acquired. And my partner, Jake, started a personal finance company called NerdWallet that is uh, pretty successful here in the States. Great. I've checked out your profile. You you call yourself a yes man. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm always up for adventure, doing stuff, uh, very active. And, um, and I think, you know, that's been, it's sort of part of my ethos and uh, is what makes life fun. I also find you, you're quite interesting. You also you know, uh, describe yourself as pronoid and, uh, you know, a Zoom bachelor. I'm assuming <laughs> those are just different facets of you. Yeah. For those who don't know, what do VCs actually do? We spend time meeting with entrepreneurs, businesses that they need to raise money for. We choose founders that we want to work with, building companies that we think are going to be large in the future and that we, you know, want to spend our time on. And then we spend, we, we invest money and time into making their company successful. So, so now diving a bit into, you know, that investment criteria, you know, for a lot of uh, our listeners who are obviously African founders and entrepreneurs, maybe do you mind breaking down for us? For example, what do you consider when selecting a company to invest in? There are several categories we think about, but the ones we think about most are number one, the team. Is this the right team to go after this opportunity? Number two is that we call it the TAM, the total addressable market size. Um, so is there, are they going after a big market or even if they're successful, is the company just not going to be that big? So we think about the market size and then traction, like sort of what have they done to date? And then sort of technology, like what do they have a real technology advantage in their product? Uh, and th those are the things broadly that we think about. There's no like individual scoring or anything like that, but those are the, the things that matter to us. I know you also work with uh, different partners uh, in emerging markets. I know you work with Catalyst, for example. Uh, do you also have a process when selecting your investment partners? When selecting other folks who are investing with us? Is that? Yes, yes. This business is a relationships business and you know your reputation matters a lot. So we work with folks who we have a strong relationship with. We're always, always bringing on new folks and in different companies, we work with different other investors and, you know, sometimes we just get along really well. And some of those folks have become really good friends. Uh, going back also again to the founders, would you consider as founders of for any startup that's looking to raise or what would you say is the path of least resistance, uh, for example, to get funding? There's no easy path to get funding, unfortunately. It's like different things, but I think the best way to do it is to run a process where you know, you meet a bunch of different investors, figure out which investors you like, and then invite them to, to uh, learn about your company at a similar time. So for example, when, when you meet founders, do you look at a pitch or what does a good pitch look like for you? You know, have you ever been pitched, for example, and you are sold into within maybe the first sentence or the first minute? <laughs> so if we're sold quickly, it's not because of what the founder said. But because of the background, like, you know, what we know about the company already, but it's never that early. It's never the first sentence. It's maybe in one meeting, it could happen. In terms of the pitch, it's really, it's always a conversation. So we are just meeting and talking about the business. And sometimes they will, you know, use a pitch deck, sometimes not. But we always think it's useful to have a pitch deck or a memo that sort of presents what the company is working on. Now, let's be more specific in Africa, obviously, because that's where we are based in. How are you looking at Africa? I know you've uh, invested in a few companies, but right now, holistically, how are you looking at Africa? Is it 
Is it a potential ground right now? Or how do you see the growth across the continent? We are really excited about Africa. I think, you know, many companies will be built not just in Nigeria, not just in Ghana, not just in Kenya, but across Africa. We've seen that in some of our companies already. So we led the pre-seed of Chipper Cash, which is a peer-to-peer payments company that also has, um, does cross-border payments and has a card product, has crypto and, and other features. We, we recently made an investment in a company called Kadana that is an earned wage access play. They started in Ghana. They are moving into Nigeria next. Um, And then we're also investors in a company called Smile Identity that does identity for Africa. In general, I think we look for folks targeting big markets. Uh, So most of the companies we work with will have Nigeria at some point on the, on their roadmap, but you don't need to, I think they're, you know, there are big opportunities elsewhere as well. Obviously, Chipper Cash stands out as one of, uh, you know, uh, the key companies in Africa. Maybe do you mind telling us how how do you pick winners like Tupacash? I think I met um, Haman Majid and quickly thought, hey, these guys are really sharp. They're building something really special here. I think that actually happened pretty quickly. And then the more time I spent with them, I realized that they have been through so many hardships in life, getting from Africa to here, staying here and... I thought, okay, if they could overcome all this stuff, then they're going to be able to overcome any challenge that comes their way. And so that was, you know, one of the main things that allowed me to get excited about Chipper. I think we would all agree that was a smart investment, obviously. I mean, a lot of us already use Chipper Cash and it's solving a huge, huge problem on the continent. Beyond Chipper Cash, uh, maybe... If I may ask, you've obviously invested across other other uh, regions and jurisdictions. Uh, do you see any peculiarities when you look at, for example, African teams vis-a-vis Western teams? I think the main difference is African teams are more hungry, but teams here are more experienced. And I think there is an advantage to each. If I'm going to choose a company, I'm going to choose the one with more aspirations than resources. So I, I like African entrepreneurs. Now, obviously, emerging technologies like blockchain and crypto are, are getting big. Um, you know, Africa is one of the leading spaces where P2P crypto has really taken off. Um, are you also looking in that direction as well? So from our fund, we don't invest in crypto specifically, but there are use cases for crypto that intersect with fintech. And in those cases, we will look. So uh, an example would be cross-border, cross-border payments using crypto. Stuff like that we would look at. There's a lot, most of what's happening in crypto today, it, because it's still at the infancy, is crypto projects building for other crypto folks. And that's stuff we don't look at. But where it does intersect with fintech, we do. We do. How, how about blockchain in general? Yeah, same, same thing, I think. Again, just coming back to Africa and what's happening again uh, in terms of growth. This year has seen uh, the largest, I think, funding so far, and it just continues to grow by the year. Uh, Massive this year, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So many companies raising a lot of money. Precisely. I mean, we are just halfway, and uh, I think it has already crossed what we, we saw in 2020. Do you see this trend you know, continuing like this? And at what point do you see it possibly plateauing? And why would that happen? Um, Yeah, I see this trend continuing. I think these markets and the opportunity for these companies is much more than what anybody imagined. And because of that, I think this will continue on. In terms of what could stop things, you know, it's hard to speculate. I do think we are the beneficiaries of a low interest rate environment, and that's true globally. And if that were to change meaningfully, I think that could have a negative impact on these companies' ability to raise. But uh, 
I don't see that happening. So I, I continue to be very bullish. I know that you're also working with the uh, Catalyst. Uh, you know, I, you're running the accelerator. Maybe you mind uh, telling us a bit about that? But I should... Yeah, absolutely. So Catalyst Fund is a, uh, a nonprofit fund that was originally funded by Gates, uh, the Gates Foundation and JP Morgan. And they support people building companies for financial inclusion in emerging markets. And there are some key markets that we go after, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, uh, in, and then Mexico and India outside of the continent. And through that program, we uh, provide financial support and have an accelerator program that shares insights and helps our companies sort of define who their target customer should be and does a bunch of on the ground research. So it's a, a, a pretty cool program. And uh, I'm on the investment committee of that program. Yeah, I particularly like the fact that uh, you've, you're very much focused on, on uh, startups that, that sort of solve the, the problem of you know, inclusive finance. I don't know if, uh, do you mind diving a bit deeper into that? What do you feel is the greatest hindrance to inclusive fintech, for example? And what projects do you see driving fintech inclusivity? I think the, um, when we, what we mean by inclusive fintech is giving access to finances to people who did not have access before. So, you know, chipper customers, for example, many of them did not have a bank account before. You know, the story for me comes that I was 15 years ago, I was living in India, working in microfinance. And at that time, I was just to serve one borrower, you know, I would like take a bus and get on the back of a motorcycle to disperse cash to a borrower. And today, with technology, you don't have to do that. You can do it all via the phone. That really changes things and makes things a lot easier for the borrower, both in terms of time and then, of course, money as the transaction cost gets lower. So uh, inclusive finance is bringing people into the formal financial system and you know helping make their life easier by doing so. At the same time, also, I noticed that you are very specific uh, at what point you come in as, a, as, a, as an investor. Uh, you're an early stage investor, right? Yes, we invest at seed stage. So typically we are the first institutional investor in a company. It's just what we enjoy doing. At the seed, you have the most potential for impact. Because we're the first investor in the company, we tend to be closest to the entrepreneurs and it's just what we love doing. Would you say that that also tends to be the, the, risk, the riskiest point of a business? For sure. The companies have not proven that much. Many things could fail, many things can happen, but it is the highest risk, but also highest reward. I mean, I like the way you describe it. It's at that point where a, a startup is uh, at, at the point of, of the value of death. Yeah. At, a time, at a time where the startup is trying to achieve product market fit. Maybe you can you know, elaborate on that. Sure. Product market fit is, do people want to buy the product that you're selling? So is there a market for that product. Many times you build a product and you're not sure if enough people want that product. But when you do have product market fit, you know it and you know that there's this market and all you have to do is just, you know, and, and it's not one thing. It's not like, oh, you found product market fit and then you're there. It's like continuously chasing. It's not like a switch. It's like this product market fit for a particular product, then you build a new product and expand the market and that sort of thing. So there's no like one solution here. So there's no timeline, for example, for that to happen? No. And in general, I would say that timelines are very variable. For some companies, I was talking to a founder earlier today who was working on his company for 21 years, his last company, mm -hmm. and then finally had success. But these days, it feels like success has to come in a short amount of time. But really, there's a lot of time and there's no, there's no one path to success and one timeline as we wind up i would like to ask this question especially talking to african founders and entrepreneurs what sage advice would you give them 
or that key advice uh, you've obviously you know been in the space for quite some time you've seen a lot uh, you've interacted with many teams and startups what sage advice would you give to someone in an emerging market like africa who's trying to build on emerging technologies like blockchain for example don't be afraid to fail i think especially in africa especially in emerging markets people are afraid of failure it's it's a cultural thing and i think one thing to be a lesson to be learned from silicon valley is that failure is not a bad thing it means you learn hopefully and so my one takeaway would be don't afraid to be to try things you will fail in many things and i have failed in most things but some of those things will be successful and that'll be that'll be completely worth it i see on your bucket list you have uh, rwanda and namibia yeah planning to travel soon i would love to but uh given covid i don't know when i'll be able to get out there <laughs> Yeah, we look forward to having you. I mean, uh, hopefully you can also pass by Nairobi. Uh, we would love to. Would love you. to. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you Shil for talking to us. Absolutely. Thank you.